French play history. And uh, so all of us have had experiences in the past where we would have loved to have been a little more playful. Maybe it was a social gathering or something. We would have enjoyed having a resource there. And so that you can imagine that you have been playful in the past, we were gonna f- we're going to fit some uh, resources into the past in moments in the past where you, where you would, in, would enjoy being more successful in your play. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to access a playful state, a resource state. And uh, so sometimes maybe that involves a little bit of creativity. Sometimes you may be thinking about, well, does that mean I have the ability to kind of think of things that interest others? So that in a social situation, you are talking about things that actually are interesting. Uh, being creative, being flexible. Um, so you'll be thinking of some things, in fact, that, that are, are the resources that you sense you'd enjoy having in this play state. So then you'll anchor that resource. So then uh, you'll uh, make a break a state from that, um, ask the person what they were doing yesterday or something like that, and, and then ask the person to uh, access uh, a time in the past that there was an unsuccessful play. <coughs> and have the person nod their head when they're remembering that, and so then you anchor that. That's a good idea to set up. Um, at a party, kind of, and not quite, not quite able to interact, maybe. In a play setting, you know, dancing or something, and not quite being able to dance. Um, not being able to let go somewhere. What about um, moments, moments when it would have been good to be playful, somewhat, where... Right. Okay. Um, so, so then you'll, a- you'll access an unsuccessful experience in the past, all right, and get an anchor on that, okay? And then you'll uh, access another moment in the past where you've, you've uh, been unsuccessful in your play and anchor that, okay? And anchor it in the same spot, so you, you're chaining anchors, all right? So then uh, uh, when you've got a few anchors on, from the past and you've chained them into one spot, okay? Then uh, make a break of state from that. Then ask the person to access the resourceful state and fire off the resource state while the person's accessing it. What's for the behavioural manifestation of that internal response to see that you have got the resource state there, all right? And uh, you'll then have the person... And you'll remember this moment in the past that where you'd enjoy resourcefulness being there, fire off the resource holding the both together for that moment and then release release the uh, stuck state whilst you're holding the resource state. And then once you've done that, then take the person into the future, some moment where they're sensing they would enjoy being a little more playful and uh, fire off the resource state in the future so that you're future pacing the resource that the person that you've set up with the person. Mm-hmm. Now do this quite methodically, okay? Because the, the reason why is because you'll learn a little bit like a cookbook approach here that will enable you then to kind of be doing that just in your talking without having to actually go through the formality of doing this. But do it in a way that's formal here now because if you learn it in this way, you can always do it in a formal way, all right? The main thing is that you develop ability to be creative in the change processes, change techniques that you're using and that you can be flexible in the way that you use it. Well, a minute when you were talking a while ago, uh, I was I was in a trance and I missed part of it. That I, I think it's part of me at a conscious level. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's just, a, it's just a, something about uh, what, about attributes of the resourceful state having to do with playfulness. Yes. And what what did you say about that? Okay, so sometimes you might enjoy being creative too. See, really get into the resource to make sure that you have got the resources that you would like to have in that playful state. Uh, sometimes it would be uh, maybe it's being more accepting of something, perhaps you know. Maybe in a playful state, people are kind of not so playful, but playful, but like chillest kind of happiness or something, and uh, that you would enjoy being a little bit more playful in that kind of a setting, perhaps, so rather you're, than being serious. Maybe you're taking the resource state into the unsuccessful. That you're going to build a resource state, and then you're going to be able to use that resource state after you've anchored and got some stuck state <coughs> in the history. And then you're going to... F- and you can chain them all together into the one place. Mm-hmm. The main thing is that when you are doing this in the brain, all the, the, the touch is becoming paired 
to this uh, as a stimulus to initiate that response that you're wanting from the person and that you are learning it in this way and if, in fact that is what's occurring without touch there's a way for you to be anchoring things like this you can simply get a word for that moment in the past which bring back the whole, brings back the whole memory that's an anchor okay so the main thing is let's do it with touch okay because that's the strongest way to get an anchor on things alright okay any questions okay probably a good idea to do this in threes to do this in threes okay so each of you now uh, there will be three here okay three three uh, actually uh, let's split Dan and Terry up Okay, so someone join, uh, someone join Penny and David. Who has not been with Penny or David? Like, okay. Okay. So if you feel you'd like to go to another spot to to do this, so A is going to be doing this to B, and C is going to be overviewing the whole process, and and C will be able to whisper into A's ear things if you need to do that. Yeah. Okay, so this is on page uh, 73 of the text of the practitioner's manual, if you want to just practitioner's manual, page 73. 73. <laughs> This animal has been here. Was that on or off? Oh. Okay. <laughs> we've just been talking about tracking and uh, we've said that Tracking really is the art of seeing something that's sensory specific that enables you to know that that animal has been there or this person is doing something. I gave the example before of someone telling me to do something and then you see me kind of pushing away with my feet. Well then that's, that's a track. That's a track dissociating actually. Now possibly it's dissociating from what it was that you <coughs> asked me to do. If you saw something else happen where I was dissociating again, like I moved away, then for, for, you, for sure you would know there's a pattern there. If you see something twice occur, then you can know for sure that it's a pattern, possibly in this person's life. Okay? So sometimes you'll be wanting to see something, see evidence of something, experience evidence of something twice to see possibly that it's a pattern, and you go, aha! Uh-huh. And so you're always fitting what you're tracking into a context of something occurring. And it's the context that provides the meaning. So, you know, I gave the example about someone uh, having an Oedipus complex. That might not be anything that you have tracked. And so we're going on things actually that people can, you can experience, that, that we feel. Okay. Uh, uh, tomorrow when we come back if you have any questions on what it is that you read here from pages 23 to 33 and if you have any questions on the vestibular paper I think that uh, we're wanting to answer those tomorrow you know before we start so come prepared with with some questions from the reading or something that you would like to have clarified this is the best way learning can occur if you come prepared tomorrow everyone will learn in the morning something because of what, what it is that you are highlighting. It's maybe it's something that for you is reinforced. And that we can enrich each other's learning if we do this. Okay? Alright. So, are you Dave? This is not your tangent. Don't want in Casaneda's book to talk about stalking. Yeah. Is stalking in any way related to the tracking you're referring to? Okay, now stalking is the... Uh, is the choice to change destiny. Stalking gives you the choice to change destiny, your destiny. Stalking uh, is the act of making something physical. The more in the future that you make something physical now, 
that's what stalking is. So in, in uh, when we do sessions on shamanism, that's one thing that we're teaching people to do is to stalk things. And so we might make a dream stalking stick. And on that dream stalking stick, we put the things the person finds and puts on the stick is actually symbolic of something the person's wanting actually to, to, to achieve in life. And that this is a reminder. I, sometimes I would say that you know, this medicine out there that people are practicing truly is uh, keeping the people amused while nature takes its course. And how much sense it makes for you to put some intent into something that you're making. To put, and the ingredients that go in and the intent that goes into this can be sometimes what it is that truly creates the change. So stalking is, is, the, is the choice, giving you the choice to change destiny. Stalking, if I was wanting to build something in the future, or if I had a person that I wanted to stalk, maybe I bring their photo into my life, and I put it, put it somewhere where I can see their photo, and it's reminding me of this person. Sometimes I do this with somebody that I'm working with, you know, in the healing process. I ask them to send me a photo, or send me a photo of their horse if their horse is wanting this. So that you, you are making something physical. The more that you make your dream physical, the more likely it is that you have the ability to see what it is that's there, to have choice. Stalking is the art of arriving somewhere and everything being taken care of before you arrive. If you stalked properly, then that's what's occurred. So stalking is the art of arriving somewhere and totally being comfortable having set up things in a way that, that you are arriving there comfortably. Stalking would be the art of going there ahead of time. The same as future pacing. Like future pacing, but however, it's really, stalking really is the art of making something tangible, you know, that's in the future here, so I can kind of see it and look at it and have more choice about that in the future. Whereas tracking is the art of uh, being able to observe the signs that somebody's leaving behind, physical evidence of something that you're seeing. So it would be no use you and I saying, oh, so-and-so kind of dissociates. When we talk about mother, this person dissociates. You know, I would ask you, what what is it that you have seen yourself not what somebody said to you, but what is it that you've seen yourself? And if you've seen something, then I'm saying that's tracking. And otherwise, you know, forget it. I think it's a good idea to have experience and have tracked something, actually, I think to you're go on. With prospective customers or clients. Right. And I see tracking as a way to kind of augment that. Yes, right. So the person that you're stalking, you are tracking the way they go about making decisions and tracking many things about the person. Sometimes, like uh, in a shaman, uh, in a shamanic way, the person would turn themselves into an animal that they're tracking to kind of see how this animal would move, to know exactly what to do and how this animal would move, in fact, to give them information about the animal. Okay. Um, All right. Come prepared tomorrow morning, each of you, with a question that you would like to ask that creates further clarification for something. Okay? So uh, let's just do uh, Call Spirit. Uh, let's practice Call Spirit chant and then we'll uh, wrap everything up for the night. So do we, do we want... Do we want... Uh, oh, do we want... Uh, this on the tape? Do we? Okay, yes. Sure, this will be for our, our listeners from wherever they are. <laughs> Hi! Hi. <laughs> All right, okay. So I'm going to go something like this. Oh, the way I the way I
sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, also about the reading. So, who would like to start? You want us to ask our questions? Yes. Okay. Um, My question is on page three. And this is the semantics, of course, if you don't understand it. Yeah. The middle sentence of the first paragraph that starts, it should be noted here that the dynamic and static labyrinths provide contextual submodalities enabling degrees of robustness. Excellent. Okay, the contextual submodality is what I'm Excellent. Thinking. Okay. All right. Does everybody understand that question? No. Um, yes. Okay. Right. What is it about? What is it about the the, the those the static labyrinth and the dynamic labyrinth in the vestibular system that provides the robustness of our experience? And the contextual submodalities. That's really what we're okay. looking for explanation. Okay. Okay. Right. So, for instance, uh, if you move a picture away, being able to move a picture away from you to feel comfortable or to bring a picture closer to you, bringing that picture closer in, okay, out and in, are vestibular uh, submodalities which are providing a robustness of the senses, okay? You turn the volume up or you turn the brightness up, okay, up is vestibular, up is providing a robustness, okay? Uh, the vestibular system is providing the the energy, the electrical activity, how much electrical activity is going to be there and whether there's going to be equilibrium there or not. So uh, when designing submodality uh, interventions, um, there's the vestibular system that's providing the robustness of the intervention. So for instance, you might need to slow something down, which is all again vestibular or speed something up, pace it into the unconscious mind, that's vestibular. And uh, if you are just joining things together like and, then it's only using part of the vestibular system, the static labyrinth. The static labyrinth is that anatomy inside my head which enables me to be able to stand, you know, on one foot still, okay? Whereas the semicircular canals uh, that part of me that enabled me to be able to balance while moving. And uh, when you use that word while or during or as, you're bringing in the semicircular canals, mm-hmm. that part of balance which is involved while moving. And so you're bringing in much more of the vestibular system. That's why when you're using a word like while or as, as this occurs, this occurs, that's a very strong way to join things together in the language. And the reason why is because it's bringing in the other part of the, the uh, bringing it, it's bringing in the sub, the sub modalities of the the, the uh, semicircular canals in the vestibular system. And when you say that it's bringing in more of the vestibular system, do you mean more in terms of more of the anatomy? Yes, because if I'm just joining things together with and, mm-hmm. it's just joining things like this. Whereas while is bringing in. Uh, movement whilst something is occurring, something else is occurring, it's bringing in the uh, semicircular canals. And the static left? Right, yes. So you're involving more of the yes. anatomy, more structure? Yes. Okay. And do you want to know something? When you are joining things together with while and as and during, okay, as a hypnotist, mm-hmm. you know, the things that you're joining together are going to be much, much, much stronger. Because they're going to, when something's happening, there's an overlap of something else happening. Mm-hmm. So cause and effect is much more... Okay. A good question, Jenny. <laughs> I have a sentence that's very helpful. It's on page one. Everything that is not the beginning. Of the technicians. I'm just going to read it. Yeah. The whole brain functioning outlines a communication model for understanding and using vestibular submodalities. To discover how an individual thinks by observing full body movement patterns, linguistics, and eye access movements. Okay. And also, this training is in keeping with the expressed interest of evolving consciousness through a process that emphasizes one's own internal resources. 
Evolving consciousness. I wanted you to say a bit about that. Okay. Um, just the same as as. Uh, 2,000 years ago, people were getting used to the idea that God was in each person. And, and nearly uh, 5,000 years before that, uh, people were uh, developing the concept of I, you know, as a result of languages, language being written. Because before this time, everything that was passed down was passed down through story. It's much more difficult to turn your hearing off. But the minute that something was written, the laws were written, I could decide not to look at that if I didn't want to. And I, the, the integrated concept of I started to form then. And uh, so there's an evolution of consciousness moving us more away from uh, not having choice and seeing my individuality to, uh, to see, sensing my individuality. And with this left hemisphere programs and things and ability to use the left hemisphere in conjunction with the right through language, you know, consciousness has evolved. And uh, this is an evolution of consciousness. The language of peace is an evolution of consciousness because uh, it's what creates whole brain functioning. We're understanding today how when you're listening to someone, whether they're using whole brain functioning or they're using limited brain function. Um, the use of the vestibular system is very important uh, in, in, in the use of direction because hopefully we're moving toward those things that you are loving and you're bringing those things in close. So toward and in close is all about wellness and moving away and distancing self from stuff that you'd love to distance self from. This is the way to use direction. So also this consciousness is the, the mass consciousness on this planet, as well as planet. Yeah. So I always think the other person is me, actually. And I, whenever I hear this I, I always sense it as having a social context. Yeah. I would think that evolve and involve are vestibular predicates. Yes, they are. So the vestibular system, all the senses feed into the vestibular system. And you can imagine the vestibular system is seeking equilibrium for us. It's continuously wanting to seek balance and equilibrium. So if something was overloading in the brain, it would just, whoop, it would just uh, close that out somewhat to keep equilibrium there. That's how uh, senses sometimes are deleted from a person's... Uh, Experience. What's driving the uh, reticular activating system? Um, the uh, vestibular system feeds directly into the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system in the brain is that part in the brain stem which enables us to be alert. It's if you were asleep and your baby started to cry or something like that or whimper, you know, it would be what it is that's tuned at that level. It's like the reptilian complex of the brain. All the functions of a reptile, basically, you can imagine, to be kind of housed there. The reticular activating system is that aspect of our neuroanatomy which enlivens everything else. Or dampens. Or dampens. So that's the mechanism? It's, yes. It's, um, the vestibular system is seeking <coughs> balance and needs to kick some stimuli out. To prevent some, overload. It does it to activate if there was the reticular overload, activating system. Yes. Like the reticular activating system then stops the impulses coming in. Yes, like for instance, someone uh, someone who's afraid, you know, of heights, for instance. Okay, um, this person, uh, the way they get, you know, the way the person's afraid of heights is that they're imagining. It's possible that they're imagining that they're falling, and you know yourself. If you read the paper. Those things that you imagine and those things that are real, the body perceives the same way. So it's very interesting that people could feel that, oh, I'm in danger or something like that. You know, it's, it's very funny to me a little bit because there really isn't anything that's, that's uh, involving anything other than safety out there. However, it's okay that a person's sort of imagining that they're in a dangerous situation because they're eliciting a physiology, you know, which they're going to be walking through. And this physiology is possibly the same as it would be out there in the real world where somebody's feeling, oh, God, I don't know whether... I can do this and then you've had the experience of walking, moving through something that you fear 
and gaining much greater expanded sense of self as a result. So the person up in the elements that's afraid uh, of heights, let's say that they imagine that they're falling and that's going to stiffen up the musculature like this. They're imagining that they're falling so they've got to be up in visual construct. Now, if they're in visual construct, they're starting to lose varying degrees of touch with the external world because up here, up to the left, is visual memory. And it's visual memory which enables me to, na- to match the things that are on the outside with what I'm understanding that I've seen before. So it's visual memory that's connecting me with the external world. And if the person's in visual construct constructing this image of falling, right, it, the, and it's, it's uh, scaring the person a little bit, it's uh, creating a, a reef, corresponding reflex in the body, stiffening up the body. It depends on the person's coping style. Some people will, they'll create a degree of kind of plasticity and they're hardly be able to do anything at all. Others will be very rigid, uh, wanting to act but not wanting to act. So antagonist and protagonist muscles are being activated and so the mu- muscle becomes stiff. Then, if the person then is talking to themselves about it and using this quadrant down here, down to the left, right, then they're really losing degrees of touch with the external world because they're going further inside. They're in visual construct, which is internal. They're talking to themselves down here and so they're using this vector and then they'll the and in using this vector this is the use of the the vestibular system is is uh, affecting this constellation and that this constellation it, through the vestibular system is kind of knocking out uh, visual memory and uh, kinest- my ability to sequence things down over here and so uh, you know that's generally kind of the strategy that's happening out there so possibly if someone was in that situation. So what could you do yourself if you were in that situation? You could go back up into your visual memory and you could go back down into your feelings and you could make sure that these two channels are alive and open and that you're feeling connected up there, really solidly connected up there. Okay. Well, I'm doing that because some recent resource bank. Is that the main? I mean, I'm simply thinking about myself. You're talking about the highest. Yes. Right. And I'm, you know, I have some ambitions. Yes. And I'm really keen on my, my resource space. I'm really chaining them for the high ones. Is that, uh, or is that too much in No, I think uh, uh, it's right that somebody might be a little. Uh, preparing themselves inside um, and uh, the more that you are feeling ease as we go through this Dave the more likely it is in fact if you were going to make a major purchase in your life or if you were going to change business and there was some calculated risk involved you know then this let, allow this to be similar and the more the, e- the ease the, with which you can go into this the more likely it is in fact that you can handle this other stuff out there in life as well and know from us that you're perfectly safe up there and if you could imagine just like being only this high up off the ground and walking around it's going to be the same and uh, we're going to be having you on a piece of paper which Annie's going to be giving to you it's called Tickets to Ride and on that Tickets to Ride there's going to be a column for resources and a column for stuck states and you're going to be thinking about things in fact that remind you of your resourcefulness and things that are reminding you of your stuck state. And then us on the ground, we are going to be practicing what we've learned to wire in things. In fact, as you're moving and you're in balance, we'll fire off stuck states. And when you're in need of bringing balance you know, to the movement, that we are able to remind you of resourcefulness. Okay, so we're going to be doing that as well. Okay. David, I have two more yeah. Question. Is that okay for somebody else? Now go for it, Jim. Go for it. Yeah. Page yeah. one. It's more of just um, solid reasons. There's conjecture here that movement correlated with one's senses stimulates neocortex areas, activating ferromagnetic channels. 
which inspire modulation from the brainstem through to the periphery of the neocortex. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to know is when you say it inspires myelination, you mean it like activates myelination? You just use that word there. It inspires? Yeah. How do, yeah. It yes. Inspires in other words, uh, we worked with a woman last night in a swimming pool, Jenny and I did, uh, and uh, it's important that we're starting now to get her to have this cross-modal mm-hmm. functioning while she's swimming and that she has the ability to sustain this, right? Because this cross-modal functioning is going to send neural pathways through the brain, coordinating and connecting again. Mostly the myelinization uh, that's going to occur, uh, you know, there's also going to be uh, glial cells migrate to support this function occurring again in her brain. And uh, the, the, when we first see through our eyes, this starts to get neural pathways going back through to the uh, occipital lobes when we're, when we're you know, y- yay big. Uh, the more that we are seeing things, in fact, the more these pathways are innovated. The more the child kind of moves and things like that and climbs and balances and stuff, the more that these neural pathways are being uh, innovated. And um, that's one reason why people have a defective pleasure system. Um, especially in cities, people who have grown up in a city environment didn't have much opportunity to kind of be running and jumping and kicking and doing all that sort of stuff, right, and cl- climbing. Mm-hmm. Um, what we know today is that it's, it's more likely that, that, it's, uh, that there's the possibility there that this person grows up to have a defective pleasure system. And uh, m- schizophrenic uh, conditions and uh, most, or most uh, inhibitory and aversive conditions are all as a result of a little bit of a defective pleasure uh, system somewhat. And uh, anyway, we can increase this. This is the brain is really functionally plastic quite incredibly. We have the ability truly to uh, increase this by what we do, you know, by having a value for laughter and having a value for, for uh, smiling and humour and light-heartedness and truly being a bearer of good news to people. So the, the um, wiring that you're saying that movement correlated with one sense senses stimulates neocortex areas, okay, get all that activating ferromagnetic channel, kind of that, inspire myelination, from brain stem through to the periphery of the neocortex. So the information is coming up through the brain stem. Yes, so the, the, the small baby its neural pathways are growing from the brain stem up through all the way to the cortex and the left hemisphere is the most peripheral of our anatomy mm-hmm. and it's kind of the last to get these projections all the way through which is the uh, uh, pyramidal uh, cells and they're very long mm-hmm. they go from they, they grow all the way up into the uh, motor cortex strip right and they go all the way back down into the brain, all the way into the brain stem. Up and up and I mean, yeah, they grow from the brain stem up, mm-hmm. and finally they reach the uh, the mantle. And um, so, you know, this is not this is occurring all the way through life mostly, and it, it you know mostly is still occurring quite incredibly all the way up until late twenties. And uh, we still have the ability somewhat to. Uh, to continue this right through life, that you're developing t- skills, you know. So is that why sometimes with children, there's like a an age, like you might present information or tasks to a four-year-old, and then five, four or five months later, if they haven't practiced the task at all, they all can do it, they can understand like math. The, yes, the right hemisphere processes from the gestalt. It's understanding all things. Mm-hmm. That learning through the right hemisphere is like the child learns language. It doesn't have to have language to learn language. Mm-hmm. It's learning it much more through a holistic approach. Right? Whereas adults learn much slower, you know, because they're learning it through language, which is a much slower function. It's like uh, somebody learning to play that piano and learning, you know, doing it by reading music. <laughs> you know, this can be very slow. But if the person was to learn to play the piano by learning just a little tune and then expanding 
on that and then expanding on that and then they're absolutely playing beautifully you know right from the start actually you know rather than learning this note da 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 or something like that you know. yeah. one more question On page 16. I hope everybody has a little bit of a question, you know, on this reading, on the readings. Okay, 16, the, the last sentence, I'll read it. The sentence just doesn't make sense to me. Right. The basic rest activity cycle for parasympathetic and sympathetic for right left hemisphere activity. Okay, do you know understanding that first? The basic rest activity cycle, cycle, okay, that's sleep and awakefulness, Mm -hmm. that's horizontal position and the vertical position, okay. Okay, parasympathetic or sympathetic. Okay, so what is is the parasympathetic nervous system? The rest cycle. It's the aspect of ourself which is above the thoracic region, the neck, all the nerves taking in the neck and all the nerves uh, from from here down, you know, the the anus and uh, the sphincters that are happening down there. Okay, from here up and from here down, just to here, okay. All right, this is all parasympathetic activity. The parasympathetic nervous system is what relaxes you. Sympathetic activity is what stimulates you, okay. All right, and, and okay, so now what we know is from research is that the right hemisphere is a little bit more involved in parasympathetic activity and that the left hemisphere is more involved in sympathetic activity. So the right hemisphere is a little bit more involved in rest and, and relaxation, and the left hemisphere is a little bit more involved in, in uh, activity. Okay, Jen, go ahead. Okay, so right and left hemisphere activity. Due to the electromagnetic interaction we have with the universe. Where's that now? Oh. Okay. Uh, now the ethmoid organ, okay, located behind the back of the nose, is festooned with uh, the body's own natural lodestone crystals. Mm-hmm. That's that's uh, completely orientated to magnetic north. Okay? <laughs> and it enables a person. If a person was tracking out through the bush that way, okay without having to completely always be sensing the direction that they're going on, going in, there's an unconscious process that's enabling them that this is set like a, like a switching setting mechanism that's occurring in the brain. The ethmoid organ also picks up micro-pulsations coming through from the, the, uh, the Earth's uh, and the atmosphere and the way that the Earth resonates, right? The ethmoid organ is picking up these micro pulsations that help uh, tune various organs and various functions in the body. For instance, at four o'clock uh, at night, this is when mitotic uh, division occurs. Majorly, it occurs during this period of time because the DNA in the nucleus of the cells and growth hormone is released. It's all released as a result of the micro pulsations being just perfect at that moment for this to be released. Um, the basic rest activity... This needs a okay. verb. It needs something. Needs a verb. Yeah. Okay, where is that? Um, very, the last three words on page 16. The basic rest activity cycle. Or I understand everything and then you A or B or C, we have in... We have oh, with cycle, the universe. Okay. If something is... <coughs> Our functions we share with the Oh, universe. yes, okay. You know something? Um, there's, yes, there's something left out here on this paper. Okay. Okay. Um, gee, what a shame. All of that's missing. Yes, that's true. There's quite a bit in there that's, that's missing. Um, the basic thing that I, that's missing from this paper, um, you know, I don't know, the machine has just done that or something. I don't know. The computer. Uh, the thing that's missing is... Um, First of all, uh, the uh, parasympathetic activity very much is involving rest, which occurs when you lay down. When you stand up, which is the, the uh, vertical position, all right, tonus is increased and a, and a person becomes more into an alert state because the tonus in the body is creating this alertness. The, the, the 
main thing there, I'm starting actually to talk about time, and it's interesting, there's quite a bit, I think, missing, quite a bit actually, it's maybe even a page or something. Um, the vestibular system is that organ that's, that's involved in time, in uh, as enabling us to be able to tell time. And the basic uh, way that we tell time somewhat is through this uh, rest uh, and activity cycle that's occurring in the, in the, in the body, night and day. Um, time basically is movement through space. That's what time is. Okay. And uh, what enables us to uh, perceive movement through space is the vestibular system that's involved in this. So, uh, if you would say during or while or before or later on, that's uh, involving uh, a time distinction, and it's uh, it's this is uh, involving the vestibular system. Um, anyway, there's some other stuff in there too. I think that we'll just have to make sure. That. Yeah. Okay. Asking the referential index. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Page twenty-six. Page what? Twenty-six. Mm-hmm. Okay. So hopefully these questions are kind of really helping us become more aligned with what the vestibular system is. Um, it says on the very first sentence, behavioral change agents have emphasized language in accessing specific behavior. This root emphasizes neocortex limbic thalamic direction. However. The most habituated unconscious behaviors tend to be initiated by hierarchically lower brain structures. Yes. My question is, what are these habituated unconscious behaviors? What kind of what kind of stuff is that? And what are these hierarchically lower brain structures? Yes. Okay. All right. First thing is that out there, the most the major emphasis for change has been, you know, to talk to you, right, and to. And actually, it's a cognitive neocortex-type pattern approach to get at the change, right? However, what we're realizing is that all habituated learned behavior is arriving from the, the brainstem up rather than from the neocortex down. So from the neocortex down, it certainly is a path. You know. However, I think that one, a major way of bringing about the change truly is to work from the brainstem up. So working from the brainstem up is like you see somebody painting and they're painting their dream. This is like the emergence of fields who are starting now really to be working from the brainstem up, actually. Like drama therapy, where a person actually acts out something. Or like all of the kinds of things that we're doing here where we're totally interested completely in what the movement component is. That's all we're really interested in, mostly. And actually, everything is the sum of something moving, actually. So we're totally interested in, in where spatially this, this, this thing is, um, how far away it is, um, uh, how much uh, ease is being felt in the body, which is to do with the movement and the, you know, of everything together or apart or whatever. So everything truly is the sum of something moving and the, what we are really doing here that we're emphasizing is, you know, it's no good, you know, the person talking cognitively about pride, you know. It's just not going to cut it. It may eventually cut it, right? But what we're saying is we're emphasizing, hey, you know, put your shoulders back, put your heart out. Then you're going to feel pride for sure. It wouldn't matter how much cognitive neocortex type patterning we talked about pride. There's no way that you're going to feel pride unless you put the shoulders back and the heart out. So it wouldn't matter about somebody talking about being light-hearted and you see them stomping around the room. You know, Better off uh, checking out what it is that's happening with the body, actually, and shaping those things that you naturally see.